Okay, welcome to our first look at Bayes' theorem. This image of Bayes was made a long time after his death. I'm tempted to say even up to a hundred years. It almost certainly is not the way he looked perfectly, but it gives us something to look at. So we're going to begin with the result that we had, the definition that we had for multiplication rule for and. So the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. We're going to translate this into H's and E's. So our hypothesis is H and our evidence is E. So our goal is to calculate the probability that our hypothesis is correct given the evidence. In other words, this asks the question, does the evidence support the hypothesis? Given the evidence, what's the probability that the hypothesis is correct? So we're going to rename A, E. We're going to rename B, H. So in an algebraic setting, we're just renaming. So that first equation, the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B given A, becomes the probability of E and H equals the probability of E times the probability of H given E. We're interested in conditional probability. Finding ands can be difficult, so we're going to try to get rid of those. So we're going to get a different result than we got earlier when we did a little algebra with this. We're going to first notice that that and is symmetric. And what that means is you can put the E first before the H or the H in front of the E, whatever you do, um, it is the same thing. So for example, the probability of E and H is the same as the probability of H and E. And once you've got that, you can substitute in what each of those mean. Namely, the probability of E and H is known from above. So I'll delete the other highlighting so we can see the one that I'm looking at. So that E and H gives us the probability of E times the probability of H given E on the left side. On the right side, we're simply swapping the letters because AND is symmetric. Notice there's no ANDs left. And we can solve for the probability of H given E. Remember, that was our goal, the probability that the evidence supports our hypothesis. So to do that, we notice that the probability of H given E is on the left side of the equation. The only other thing on that side is the probability of E. It is attached by multiplication, and of course multiplication is undone with division. So if we want the probability of H given E by itself, which is our goal, then we need to divide both sides by the probability of E. And once we've done that, we've got our first result that can be called Bayesian. Now we're going to focus our attention on the denominator. If you go back a few seconds, you can see that that's the probability of E. Basically, that's asking the probability that we got the evidence that we got. There is an element of chance when performing experiments and collecting evidence, but really that's a very abstract question. So we'd like to break it down in terms of other things that perhaps are easier to find. So to do that, we use a Venn diagram. We want the probability of E. So in the Venn diagram, that means that we are interested in the area that is both red and dark gray. So the red area is the probability of E and not H. The dark gray area is the probability of E and H. Together, that's the probability of E. This is one of those things that looks weird in notation until you think to yourself, of course, if you're interested in the probability of E, that's E and H and E and not H. In other words, when E happens and H happens, or when E happens and H does not happen. Remember, H and not H together have a probability of 100%. So we've divided up the E's among the H's and the not H's. Then we can take each of those parts separately, and we can rewrite them in terms of a multiplication rule. And so let's look at the first part to that. The first part, or the first term in that equation, is the probability of E and H. We can see that the probability of E and H is the same as the probability of H and E, which is the probability of H times the probability of E given H. 
We can then go through and do this again for the probability of E and not H, and then we can put this all together. In other words, we can rewrite that first equation, the probability of E, but we can rewrite it with the new pieces that we've got, and boy, does it go on. So we can rewrite it as we did in the first step, and then use the probability of E and H and the probability of E and not H to make a new denominator. So notice that we're making the probability of E into what's highlighted now, the probability of H times the probability of E given H plus the probability of not H times the probability of E given not H. And that's our new denominator. And so you might say to yourself, well, there's some new stuff that crept in here, including the probability of not H. But remember, if we're able to find the probability of H, the probability of not H is just as straightforward. It's just one minus the probability of H. So one more algebraic translation and we've got it. The probability of not H becomes one minus the probability of H. My goodness gracious. So what does this mean? This means that we can calculate the probability that the hypothesis is correct given the evidence, that's our goal, from only three terms. Now, I did that really fast, and I do not expect you to be able to recreate the algebra that I just did from watching that once at the speed that I did it. So let me just go through and point out that at the end of that, we made our way down to just three terms. So let's count them. There's the probability of H. There's the probability of H. And there's the probability of H. That's the first of our three terms. The probability of E given H. The probability of E given H. There's the second of our three terms. And the probability of E given not H. So just three terms and we can calculate the probability that our hypothesis is correct given the evidence. Now let's name these. The probability that the hypothesis is correct is called the prior probability of H, or just the prior. Or you could call it, if you were in a medical situation, the base rate, at least that's what I've heard. It's the best estimate of the probability of the hypothesis before considering any evidence. So what we believe before we have constructed new evidence for this. The probability of E given H is the probability of getting the evidence we got under the assumption that H is true. If H is true, what's the probability that we'd get that evidence? The probability of E given not H is the probability of getting the evidence we got under the assumption that H is false. Now, that seems weird. We're trying to show that that evidence supports our hypothesis. But it's too easy, and this is true for statisticians as much as for anyone, to be blinded by our own prejudices. So what this is facing, what this is forcing us to ask is could the hypothesis be false and we get the same evidence, the same experimental evidence that we got hoping that that would show that it supports our hypothesis. So uh, a lot going on there. On the next page, we're going to talk about how this can be used to avoid fallacies. Now, there is such a thing as confirmation bias. Sometimes this is used in psychology as the tendency to seek out sources of information or sources of stories or anecdotes or anything. Um, that supports our own prejudices. In other words, it's backwards. We're assuming that the hypothesis is true and asking the question, does the evidence support that hypothesis? What's the likelihood or probability that we would get that evidence given that our worldview or our hypothesis is true? Now, it's, it is true that if the probability of E given H is high, we may say that the evidence is consistent with our hypothesis. It confirms our own biases. However, if we ignore the probability that the evidence is true given that the hypothesis is false, 
we may fail to learn that evidence is also consistent with the hypothesis being false. That is, there could be another explanation, or other explanations, plural, for the evidence, even if the hypothesis we've formulated is not correct. The other fallacy that can be addressed head-on from Bayesian probability is forgetting to factor in the base rate. The base rate is humongous. So if I tell you the test is 99% accurate and that you have a positive test, remember that means that you have whatever disease this test tests for, hence there's a 99% chance that you have the disease. It is very easy to fall into that trap. So two things that Bayesian statistics allows us to avoid, confirmation bias, the belief that if the evidence supports our hypothesis, we don't have to worry about whether the evidence supports the hypothesis being false, and the fact that even if a test is 99% accurate, that doesn't mean that you have a 99% chance of having the disease. So let's look at an example from medicine. So sensitivity. Sensitivity is that 99% number that we were just looking at. Assume a test is 99% accurate. I'm saying that as if that's a tremendously good thing, and, and I'm sure you'd agree it is, when the patient has the disease. This is called the true positive rate. True because 99% of the time, if you're positive, it tells you you have it. This means that if the patient has the disease, 99% of the time, the test will be positive, indicating that the patient has the disease. Notice there's two things running around here. There is a hypothesis, and there is the evidence, the test. So let H be the hypothesis that the patient has the disease. So H, if H is true, the patient has the disease. If H is false, the patient does not have the disease. Let E be the evidence that the test is positive. If E is true, the test comes back positive. If E is false, then the test come back, comes back negative. In this example, if you have the disease, that is, given H, given that the patient has the disease, the test comes back positive, that is, the evidence supports that hypothesis 99% of the time. Now, similarly, we could say that there is a false negative rate of 1%, 0 0.01. Specificity. Assume that the test is 98% accurate in the true negative rate, which means that if the patient does not have the disease, 98% of the time, the test will be negative. So if we're assuming that the patient does not have the disease, then the hypothesis is not true. So we have the negation of H. And in that situation, we want to ask, how often does the evidence support that? In other words, how often is the evidence going to say that this patient does not have the disease. And so in this case, we're told that the probability of not E given not H is 98%. And similarly, we could say the false positive rate is 2%, given that that's the complement of 98%. Now, all that's great and marvelous, and we'll plug it in in a second. But the thing that we are really focusing on here is the idea that there's some background rate. There's a, there's information that we know about the incidence of this disease in general. So here we're assuming that one in a thousand people in the population have the disease. This is the a priori information, the prior. In this example, the probability of H is 1,000th, 0.001. So the question is, if the evidence says that you have the disease, in other words, the test comes back positive, so given that, the test came back positive. So given E, the question is, what's the probability of H? That is, do I have the disease, even though I was told that the test came back positive? Well, there's that extraordinary formula from the previous page. And then at the bottom, translated into the data that we have from the sensitivity and specificity for this test. And on the next page, we'll plug it in. And when we do that, we get a remarkable result. The chance that I actually have the disease, even though the test is 99% accurate by some measures, is only 4.7%. I mean, do the arithmetic yourself, and you will convince yourself that I have a less 
than 1 in 20 chance of actually having the disease. Now that is a lot of algebra, a lot of arithmetic, a lot of words, and if you're a nursing major, if you're a, in going into pre-med of any time, you're probably eating this up and thinking, finally we've got to some interesting stuff. For the rest of us in the class, you're probably thinking to yourself, am I in the right class? This is some pretty heavy-duty medicine being thrown at you. So let me make the following claims. I claim that there is a simpler way to do this that's a little bit more intuitive, and we're going to do that right now. I also claim that once you've worked with this for a little while, it really does start to convince you that it is very easy to start to believe your own snap judgment, your own prejudices, and that it is very helpful to have something out there to help us reason through those. So here is that same information arranged as a table. And this is extraordinary because it's all here. You can see everything. In fact, there is the answer already at the bottom. No substitution, no concern about sensitivity versus specificity versus background rates. This is everything. So if you're a visual person like myself, you may prefer this much more. There's some examples in our homework as well and in the um, project for Bayesian statistics. So I've used words that I think are a little bit easier to understand, diseased and healthy instead of the H's, and tests positive and tests negative instead of the E's and the not E's. So notice that we're starting with 100,000 people, so that's the total. And of those 100,000 people, we're going to use the background rate. It tells us that one one in a thousand people is diseased. Well, there's a hundred thousand people, therefore a hundred people have the disease. Now, remember that we can use the complement to figure out how many are healthy. Well, that's just everyone else. If you take a hundred from a hundred thousand, you're left with ninety-nine thousand nine hundred. Now, we then say the test is ninety-nine percent accurate. What does that mean? That means that if you have the disease, so among these hundred folks who have the disease, if you get the test, it will tell you 99% of the time that you have the disease. Now, 1% of the time, it will return a false negative. And so one of those people will have the disease, but the test won't catch it. Now, look at what we've got here. We've got enough information to complete this table. We're also told the specificity, which tells us that the test is 98% accurate with the true negative rate. So if you don't have the disease, 98% of the time it will tell you that you don't have the disease. So let's look at some arithmetic here. There are 900, nope, there are 99,900 people who do not have the disease. When they have the test, 98% of them will be told that they don't have the disease. So when we do that arithmetic, 99,900 times 0.98, we get 97,902. Well, 97,902 is exactly the number of folks who receive a, a negative test saying that they do not have the disease and, in fact, they do not have the disease, right? This is the healthy column. So now let's figure out what to do with that information. That's actually enough to complete the table. We've got the total of the healthy people and the healthy people whose tests are negative. When we perform that subtraction, we get the other number. And notice that we can get the totals now simply by adding up. If we add across 99 plus 1,998, we get 2,097, and when we add 1 to 97,902, we get 97,903. So we can work through using the base rate, the sensitivity, the specificity to complete this table. Now what we're interested in is the probability that the hypothesis is true, that is, that we have the disease, given that the evidence says that we have the disease, the test came back positive. So given E means that we're given that the test came back positive. 
So we're only looking at the 2,097 people who got a phone call or an email saying that the test came back positive. Now, of those, what number are diseased? And the total there is 99. Only 99 of the 2,097 people who got the email or the phone call saying that their test came back negative actually have the disease. And again, that's 4.7%. So that is an introduction to Bayesian statistics. Let's look at some history. This is taken from our book. For a long time, there was a great controversy between Bayesians and frequentists. There still is. Um, less so because much of the ideas of Bayesian statistics, the idea of um, using computer models, the idea of using algebra, the idea of considering the base rate, the idea of challenging any biases that you have is considered much more mainstream. And in fact, if you make those changes to classical statistics, if you allow classical statistics to kind of broaden its reach, then they are in fact fully compatible, which sounds great. And I think if you talked to any statistician about the history of the causal link between smoking and lung cancer, they'd say that we knew that smoking caused lung cancer in the 1950s. So in a sense, that is a kind of end of the frequentists model of having to perform experiments to show everything. And the last thing we're doing is a summary. And this is very useful because we're doing it by word. So we're taking all of our results from this chapter and putting them together. If I see a not, I'm talking about a complement. And a complement simply says everything that is not it. Remember, everything is 100%. That's 1. 1 minus the probability of A is the probability of not A. We can say that there are two rules for ORs, the rules when we have mutually exclusive and not mutually exclusive situations. When we have the probability of A and B equal to zero, remember that's the definition of being mutually exclusive. When two events are mutually exclusive, they can't happen together. Finding the probability of one or the other happening is simple. It's just the probability of one plus the probability of the other. This generalizes to more cases. If, however, they are not mutually exclusive, that means they can happen at the same time, then we have to remember that there's an overlap. Some of the probability from the P of A comes from the same place as the probability in the P of B, so we have to subtract that overlap. So there's where mutually exclusive comes in. When we see the word and, we're talking about independence. We need to know if the two events are independent. If they are, that basically means that one event happening does not affect the probability of the other event happening. So if I'm asked for the probability of A and B, those asterisks simply mean to multiply the probability of A times B. If, however, the probability of B depends on whether A has occurred or not, then these events are not independent. And I need to say that the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Not just the probability of B, but the probability of B given that A has happened. And that finishes our very long and very useful, I hope you'll find, discussion of probability.